to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu melech haralem asher kishanu b'mitzvatah v'tzivanu lo'asak pinterei Torah. Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's word sweet in my mouth, in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name in the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. <clears throat> Remain standing as we read from the uh, Torah portion, which will be from Deuteronomy chapter 11, 13, then from the... Um, 1 Kings chapter 19, 11 through 13, and then finally from the Brit Karashal, Romans 10, 17. I, I took it easy on Isaiah today. You know, he's getting older, and it's just hard for him sometimes. Hallelujah. So if you listen carefully to my mitzvot, which I am giving you today, to love Jehovah your God and serve him with all your heart and all your being. <laughs> First Kings 19, 11-13, he said, Go outside and stand on the mountain before Jehovah. And right then and there, Jehovah went past. Mighty blasts of wind tore the mountains apart and broke the rocks in pieces before Jehovah, but Jehovah <coughs> was not in the wind. And after the wind came an earthquake, but Jehovah was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire broke out, but Jehovah was... Not in the fire. And after the fire came a quiet, subdued, small, still voice. And when Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his cloak, stepped out and stood at the entrance to the cave. And then a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? in Romans 10, 17, so trust or faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through a word proclaimed about the Messiah. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth, set everlasting life in our midst, and blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated with a shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, just, to, just before I get going, I just want you to uh, know something. I don't usually tell people, but um, the Lord prompted me to uh, start a fast. So I'm in the middle of, uh, in the midst of a fast. And I um, I don't, like I said, normally tell people, but what he wanted me to tell you is this, that if you have special prayer requests, if you have something that is pertinent, not just, you know, <clears throat> oh, bless me, bless me, bless me. Um, he really wants me to gather those from you and during this time of prayer and prayer and fasting to really pray over those things that are special to your heart. So if you have anything that's really special to your heart, urgent that you need Yehovah to do, <clears throat> why I'm on this fast, I want to be praying for them. And uh, because we know that uh, fasting and prayer does break a lot of things. So um, if you are interested in giving me something, I will be more than happy to be praying for that um, during this time of consecration. Okay? Hallelujah. Well, when we look at this Torah portion, if you weren't here last week, it's actually a, a, a kind of a continuation because we talked last week about Shema. And that <clears throat> Shema means to hear. It means a lot of things. Uh, it's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we read that, and we also understand that there are two versions, if you want to say it that way, or two times it's spoken about, and that was last week's Torah portion, and then also in this week's Torah portion. And what we learned last week was, is that the one in Deuteronomy 6 was for who? You individually. Because in the Hebrew language, it was the you that was singular. So he was telling you. And the one today in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 13, is for <clears throat> the kahila. Because it is the you, which is plural. We won't know that 
uh, when we read it in English, but we do know when we read it in Hebrew. So we understood that in order to be the kahila that we need to be, we have to be the, the, the disciple that we need to be because uh, we cannot have a strong house unless you were strong relationship with Yehovah. We talked about that, and <clears throat> if you didn't get it, it's on tape or it's on YouTube or whatever. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 11, 13 through 14 because I, I find this to be very interesting uh, this day and this um, uh, parasha, this Torah portion. It says, now, if you... Shema, or listen obediently, Shema, listen and obedient, <clears throat> to my mitzvah that I am commanding you today. And then he tells you what it is, to love Yehovah your God and to serve him with all your heart and soul. Then I will give rain for your land in the season, the early rain, the late rain, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. And if we just understood in a very simple way, what we see is if that if we hear him and we love him, there's a blessing coming. Right. And who don't want a blessing? I mean, that's not being, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, secular. We all we all want a blessing. I want a blessing. I've come here today to be blessed by Yehovah. I've come to bless him, but I've also come to be blessed by him, by in my praise and worship as he inhabits the praises of his people. And also by the word of God, as it goes forth, that it might change my life. Right. So it is one of the most important words in Judaism. It's one of the most important words within our uh, belief system. And it's also one of the least understood, that word Shema. It is so misunderstood that sometimes we miss the very power of it. Shema is a key word in the book of Devarim or the book of Deuteronomy. It's a key word, which means it appears no less than 92 times. <clears throat> which is more than in any other book of the Torah, okay? And we find in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4, and now we find it here in Deuteronomy chapter 11, 13, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, and it shall come to pass if you surely listen to my commandments, which I am commanding you today to love Yehovah your God, to serve him and with all your heart and your soul and all your resources, something very spectacular is going to happen in your life. For he's come to give us what? Life and to give it to us <clears throat> more abundantly. So when we look at the word Shema, it is fundamentally untranslatable in English. Okay. Because it means so many things, and it's up there right now. What does it mean? It means, <clears throat> say it with me, it means to what? To hear. It means to listen. It means to pay attention. It means to understand. It means to internalize. It means to respond. It means to obey. So basically, it's untranslatable in English. It's eeny, meeny, miny, mo, whichever one you decide to translate. And because it's untranslatable, <clears throat> Time and time again, we find that in the last month of the life of Moses, he continued to tell the people, Shema, 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 Shema. Listen, pay attention. <clears throat> Listen, pay attention. Hear what I'm saying. Hear what Yehovah is saying. Listen to what he wants from us. And if you've ever been in, the <clears throat> in a house, a, a kahila, or even in this house, you will hear that God a lot of times tells us to what? Listen, pay attention. What I'm about to say is important. Listen to what he wants, what I want from you. Pay attention. So we would, <clears throat> if we would only really then listen, we'd be ahead of the game. But we are hard-headed and deaf a lot of times. Correct? See, biblical Judaism, when I say biblical Judaism, <clears throat> you all understand what I mean, right? Um, the word of God and, and how it was first created, because there is rabbinical Judaism, which takes on a different animal. So I always like to refer to biblical Judaism, which is just the Torah, the word of God, the half Torah and, and the, whole, the whole gospel. The biblical Judaism is actually a religion of listening. It's a religion of listening. It's very important. If we have problems with our spouses, what do we say? There's no what? Communication. When we have problems with our children, what do we say? <clears throat> There's no communication. They're not listening to me. You're not hearing. Why don't you hear me? Why don't you be, why don't you be obedient? Hear what I'm saying. Why don't you? Are you hard at it? Right? When we have problems in the house, what's it from? Communication. 
It's communication, all right? So here's biblical Judaism, <clears throat> which is a religion of listening. Listen, this sermon today can change your life if you want it to, okay? In, in general, when you encounter a word in any language that is untranslatable into its own language, like we had with Shema, <clears throat> you are actually close to the very beating pulse of that culture. Because in order to understand that word, you have to now <clears throat> be prepared to move out of your comfort zone and enter in another mindset that is significantly different from yours. We all can agree that's how it's been with us. When we've changed from <clears throat> not being Torah observant to being Torah observant, that it is, it is a hard way to understand because we're trying to understand a Hebrew thought pattern that is not ours. You cannot understand a Hebrew thought pattern in English. You have to remove yourself from the comfort zone, and you have to start thinking differently, right? When I go to Africa, I have to think differently. All the idioms, all the things that I say here, <clears throat> I can't say there because they don't understand it. Wow, yesterday I was, stabbed, I was stabbed in the back. They would think, are you okay? Because they don't use the idioms like I've stabbed in the back. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so I have to be careful because in order to understand them and be able to uh, relate to them, I have to go to their culture. And I end up having to speak sometimes in a broken English, which is so why sometimes when I come back I'm speaking you know, in a broken English, I have to kind of go back and forth. So to understand this untranslatable word, we have to get out of our comfort zone. To understand this word of God in a lot of areas, we have to get out of our comfort zone. Because we can't get it unless we do. And we don't like to get out of our comfort zone because we like our comfort zone. So the two foundations on which Western culture, you and I, <clears throat> was built were, was built on ancient Greece and ancient Israel. Okay? That's the two cultures. Well, <clears throat> these are two distinct, different cultures. And when we understand it, then we're going to understand a little bit better about ourselves. Greek is a very visual culture. It has to do with the eye, with seeing. And we see that because they produce great art and make great sculptures and <clears throat> they have uh, great theatrical performances and the Olympics came from them. And so when we understand that, we understand that everything about a Greek culture is about seeing, 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 seeing. And in fact, Plato's thought of knowledge as a kind of a depth. Or, or deep vision, he sees beneath the surface to the true form of things, which means if you can see it, <clears throat> then you can understand it. This idea that knowing is seeing actually remains the very dominant metaphor in our own life today. You don't realize it, <clears throat> but you, you use it. You speak of, wow, what great insight. Wow, I wish I had some foresight. I wish I had some hindsight. Right? We say, well, I, I'm going to offer you an observation. Let me just adopt a perspective. Let me give you an, uh, <clears throat> an, an illustration. Let me uh, have this, uh, let me illuminate the situation to you. Let me shed some light on this issue. It's all about what? Seeing. Visual. And when we understand something, we say, <clears throat> if I, I say, oh, here, this is what it is, and you finally get it, what do you say? Oh, I see. Oh, I see it now. Right? So we still have some Greek stuff in our brains mixed in our lives. Biblical Judaism offers a radical alternative. <clears throat> and the radical alternative we represents in the Shema. And that is, it is a faith in a God we cannot see. A, a God who cannot be represented visually. Now, I'm not talking about, oh, I see him in the trees, I see him in the sky. No, you don't. You see the trees and you see the sky. You happen to know that he made them, <clears throat> but you don't see him in the trees and the sky. If you saw him in the trees and the sky, everybody would get saved. Okay? Because of your information, because of your relationship, that's why you see him. But you don't see him in the sky. And it, <clears throat> a tree is a tree. It's, it's, rain is rain to the most average person. Correct? No one goes out and says, oh, it's raining. Oh, I bless the Lord. God bless. No. They just say, wow, it's raining. Hope it stops raining. The scripture says <clears throat> uh, the reason why we don't uh, and cannot represent him visually is because the very act of making a graven image a visual symbol is a form of idolatry, right? 
So that tells you that God is really not into the culture of seeing, but a different culture. Moses, time and time again, warns against making or worshiping any physical representation of the divine. Now, I know <clears throat> in today's world, people can get crazy. They don't put a, a, a picture up of themselves. They don't put a picture up of their family. They don't put a picture up of a, of, a, of a cow, of a lion. Okay, I think that's extreme. Okay? I think it means that you're creating this image and that you're worshiping that, and you have to pray with it, and, and so on and so forth. I think that's the way that goes. <clears throat> but it's a theme that runs throughout the Bible. Moses reminded the people that when the Israelites had a direct encounter with Yehovah, <clears throat> let's look at it. In Deuteronomy 4, 10 through 15, it says, The day that you stood before Yehovah your God in Horeb, Yehovah did what? Said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will make them say it. Hear my words, so that they... Learn to fear me in all the days that they live on the earth and so that they teach their children. Now, if I could stop here for a moment, <clears throat> wouldn't fear come greater if he would visualize and show you himself? But he's not a visual person. Now, yes, you have seen him and you have seen some displays, but I'm talking about in the overall, he's not. <clears throat> you came near and stood at the bottom of the mountain while the mountain was blazing with fire up to the heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud, and fog. We know that when he's around, those things can happen, right? Yehovah then what? Spoke to you from the midst of the fire, the sound of words you heard, but a form you did not see, only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to do, the ten words, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And Jehovah commanded me at that time to teach you the statutes and ordinances so that you might do them in the land you are crossing over to possess. So be very watchful over your souls, since you saw, <clears throat> say it with me, no form on the day that Jehovah spoke to you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Because your relationship on Yehovah is not based on what you see, but on what you hear. You can see sometimes we get messed up. Because we have to see it to believe it. We have to see movement <clears throat> in order to know he's in it. But he's not one who has to share with you his presence in a visual way. Which throws us, right? Moses mentions seeing. He is really talking about listening. <clears throat> because Jehovah communicates in sounds, not sights. He speaks. He commands. He calls. Which is why he tells us then to what? Shema. Because if his presence is revealed in <clears throat> voice, <clears throat> then the greatest asset he has given to you is your is your hearing. Hello? Listen, you've come today, hopefully, with an ear to hear. If you've come just for visual confirmation, you will miss him. You might see fire. <clears throat> you might hear earthquake. You might see some things, but he's not speaking through those. He speaks through his voice. We... <clears throat> Understand that he speaks, therefore we what? Listen. When he commands, we try to obey. We said it in Romans. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You can come in here, and you can see the movement of God. You can see a cloud of glory. You can see a dove take off. You can see running. You can see shouting. You can see praise. You can see hands lifted. You can see a manifestation of a praise, of a, <clears throat> of a revival breaking out. But that is not where God's voice is. God has a voice. Those things you see will not change you. It will raise an eyebrow. It might, it might get you to think about it. <clears throat> but unless you hear him, you will be unchanged by what you see. An example <clears throat> we find actually in next week's uh, uh, Torah portion, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 through 28. So we're giving you a peek into next week. It says, <clears throat> uh, 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 or see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, and what's the blessing? If you're what? What's the blessing? 
if you listen. If you listen to the mitzvah of Yehovah your God that I am commanding you today, but the curse, if you do not what? Listen to the mitzvah of Yehovah your God, but turn from the way I'm commanding you today to go after other gods you have not known. <clears throat> it's all about hearing. It's all about hearing, not seeing. I'll believe it. I'll believe that Yeshua is alive when I see his hands pierced. Oh, Thomas, you're a doubter. Now, Yehovah did show up and say, here are my hands. But in, in reality, what he said, you know, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Because <clears throat> if you're going to go from sight to sight to sight to sight, you're going to mess. You're going to lose it somewhere along the line because I'm not always going to show up and show you my hands. Right. Because you have to learn to what? Here. Again, I've said it even in today's uh, English, <clears throat> virtually all of our words for understanding or intellect are governed by the metaphor of sight. I've named a few. Insight, foresight, hindsight. <clears throat> we have a vision. We have imagination. We have per, uh, uh, perceptiveness. <clears throat> we have uh, making an observation. It appears that. And from the legacy, we get those things from the legacy of those ancient philosophers in Greece. They're leftovers. It's one of the leftovers you need to throw out. Biblical Judaism is a culture of the ear more than the eye. Pastor, you don't understand <clears throat> what I saw. Yeah, you're seeing is wrong. Right? Which is probably why he said there has to be two or three witnesses because your eyes deceive you. <clears throat> so you need more than your two. You need about six eyes before you make anything. How many ever saw something and thought you saw something and then re later realized you didn't see something? Right? Oh, Pastor Jeff, I passed you and waved at you. You didn't wave at me. When? Yesterday. Where was that? At Walmart. I was in Harrisonburg. It's really hard for me to wave at you from Harrisonburg. Oh, I swore it was you <clears throat> because your eyes are, can be deceived. So biblical Judaism is a culture of, of the ear more than the eye. Since in <clears throat> Western culture understanding, since that's a form of seeing, then we understand that the biblical culture is a form of Hearing or listening. So as you sit here and you're being engrafted into Israel, which means you should be getting and <clears throat> doing away with more of your ancient Greek and get into more of your ancient Israeli, if you want to say it that way, or Hebraic thought, you have to start seeing things, hearing things. So, Pastor, that's nice, but who really frankly cares? And... What does it really matter? It does matter. And the, it's very important because there is a huge difference, and I want you to understand the huge difference. <clears throat> the Greeks, the ideal form of knowledge, involves detachment. They go to a museum and they do what? They see the art and then they what? They leave. They're not part of the art. Right. They enjoy the art. They understand it, maybe. But then they go away. They're not part of the art. <clears throat> you can go to the Olympics and you're not a part of it. You can see uh, sports games and you enjoy it. But you're not what you're part of it. You're very detached. OK, I know we can get a little crazy, but basically <clears throat> the ideal form of knowledge to them involves detachment. There is the one who sees, which is the subject, and there is the one that which is seen, and that is the object, and they belong to two different realms. To make it very simple, <clears throat> when you are under the Greek influence of sight, you can become a spectator, not a participant. So what do you do when you come to church if you have Greek thought? You're looking for a movement. You're looking for something. <clears throat> if you don't see it, then you're not engaged in it. You are very detached. See, a lot of times when I'm preaching, I say, read this for me, and, <clears throat> and you're not reading it. And one of the reasons why you don't read it is because, <clears throat> and I'm not dogging you, is that you are, you are still in a detached moment. See, you're not bent over listening. You're not ready to hear <clears throat> that when I say, hey, read this for me, I'll read it for you. Because 
you're still in, in, in the thinking of, <clears throat> I've come to see. I've come to see Pastor uh, Jeff preach. I've come to see what he has to say. I've come to see the, <clears throat> the, the, the PowerPoint. I've come to see where how praise and worship goes. It's different. If you come just as a spectator and not a participant, then what happens is you're able to go through the whole service and not being engaged. You've been detached. However, speaking and listening <clears throat> are not forms of detachment. They are forms of engagement. If you're speaking to me, <clears throat> I have to listen. I have to be engaged. You might ask me a question. I might have to answer. Right? If you've come to hear the word of God, then you're ready to hear and also what? Answer. And some of the things that you can answer would be, Amen. Amen. That's right. <clears throat> That's for me. Glory to God. Because you're engaging. If you're detached, you're like, what time is it? No, really, what time is it? We all been there. When we're, when we're engaged in something, time goes fast. <clears throat> when you're detached, time goes way slow. Put some people in a car and travel to Florida, and, and in that car you're talking and laughing and giggling. All of a sudden, you're in Florida. <clears throat> put those people in that same car and go to Florida, no one's talking, you're like, Lord, it's just Georgia. <laughs> How long did they move Florida? <clears throat> because you're detached. So we have this speaking and listening. What God doesn't want us to be are Greek thinkers because he doesn't want us to be detached. He wants us to be engaged because speaking and listening create relationships. Again, number one problem of a, of a marriage is what? Speaking and listening. <clears throat> You're there. What more do you want? I'm in the house. You see me. Here I am. <clears throat> right? But I don't know where you are. What do you mean you don't know where I am? I'm here. Look at me. What's the point trying to be made? I need you to what? Engage, not detached. You can be in a marriage and detached. You can have children and be detached. You can be part of a community and be <clears throat> detached. You can say you love God and be detached because you're coming to the form of godliness and you're coming and you're doing your work. You're coming. Oh, I go here. I go there. Look at our house. Look at our church. Look what we do. We do this. We do this. It's all about seeing. But God is not a God of seeing. Don't go to the extreme. He does see. <clears throat> but he has created a culture of hearing. Because hearing makes you engage. In the cool of the day, he came and what? And he engaged in speech. <clears throat> Therefore, they heard and they engaged in speech. It wasn't like, here's God and we stand in awe. And he moves through and we say, we saw God. God. I hope that you don't come here and then <clears throat> have a great move of God and say, wow, we saw God, because that means you are detached. Anyone can see something. But what did you hear? When you leave today, what have you heard? See, the Hebrew word for knowledge, da'at, <clears throat> involves and implies involvement, closeness, intimacy. You say, I have great knowledge, then that means you have intimacy, closeness, and, and involvement. We see the example, excuse me, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. You all have that? <clears throat> you all need it again? You need to go back? Go back for a minute. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, while you're writing that, it says, And Adam knew Hava. And then, <clears throat> comma, and then it says, And then she conceived. So the natural thing for us is that she, they knew each other by having a physical seeing and forming and coming together and having relations, and therefore they had a child, right? It's all about visual. <clears throat> but actually, Adam knew Eve. If you understand it in this da'at, it means that in knowing in the Hebrew sense <clears throat> means knowing them in communication, in intimacy and in, in involvement and engagement, not in detachment. So the knowing is a Hebrew sense, not a Greek sense. In today's world, people can just sleep around. 
what it is. No what? No attachment, no engagement, <clears throat> no speaking and listening, just a matter of that's what it is, move right along. I saw you, you saw me, thank you very much. Detachment. And in fact, if you live that kind of a life, you have to kind of be detached because <clears throat> in reality, there should be an involvement, an intimacy. There should be a closeness. But, and so Adam and Eve, and Adam knew Eve, it wasn't just about a seeing a physical thing. It was about having this communication, that they saw each other in intimacy. They saw each other in speaking and listening. They heard each other. They listened to each other. <clears throat> we can enter our, into a relationship with Yehovah even though he is infinite and we are finite because we are linked by words. You cannot have a relationship with him if he showed himself. Because in his presence, you would what? <laughs> you would explode. Correct? Because he is God, and we are tiny little men, tiny little women. <clears throat> so how does he make sure that we have a relationship? Words. If you listen to me as I speak to you, then you obey me to what I said to you. Wow, your life will have a revelation of who I am in your life <clears throat> because I will cause the rain to come and the fruit to produce and the harvest to be there. <clears throat> and you will know because of that relationship, hearing, listening, speaking, listening, that I'm having relationship with you. In Revelation, Yehovah speaks to us in prayer, and then we also speak back to Yehovah. <clears throat> What's the first thing the enemy wants to take away from you? Your prayer life. Why? Because that's how Jehovah speaks to you. He doesn't care if you have a form of godliness, right? <clears throat> coming and doing, coming and doing, seeing and doing, seeing and doing. Because even the enemy knows that has nothing to do with a relationship with Jehovah. You can come and be very faithful here. <clears throat> you can come and do whatever you need to do here. You can give your money. You can do all those things. But if you're just a spectator, right? When you're a spectator and you're going to the movies, what do you do? you got to buy the movie theater ticket, correct, which is a fortune. And if you're with my wife, you have to buy the popcorn and the diet drink. If you're with Ashley, you have to buy the popcorn and drink and some candy. I don't know where she got that. <clears throat> so you've invested what? $900? <laughs> it depends on how many, you know. <clears throat> That's why you sneak off without your children. Oh, we're, we're just going to go... You try to decide, like, you, we're going to go uh, do the field. We're going to go pick uh, weeds. We'll be back. Because you know it's costly. Correct? When you go to a restaurant, <clears throat> you just pay for what is brought. You don't want to chit-chat a lot of times. But how do you take, what do you mean, how's my day? I just want my order. I'm, there's no listening and hearing going on. Just bring me my order. Right? <clears throat> and, of course, you are careful because you don't want anything in your food, so you have to be nice. <laughs> so if you want to understand any relationship <clears throat> between a husband and wife, don't look how they act. If you want to understand what that relationship is between someone and their child, don't view them. If you want to see how <clears throat> an employer or employee respond and interact, don't pay attention to what you see. Pay attention to how they speak and listen to one another. Pay attention. Oh, they can hold a hand, they can hug, they can do all those things, but listen to how they engage in communication. That's the difference. Come on. Ignore everything else. Now, it doesn't mean all young people get your eyes on all the husbands and wives here <clears throat> because now they know enough to speak nice while they're being heard. <laughs> hey, lover, bubble. Hey, come here, bubbles. Come here, precious pumpkin. Come here. It's more than that. It's how you engage. It's, it's that communication that you have, right? We learn this truth from the story in the book of Samuel. Remember the book of Samuel in Samuel chapter, <clears throat> verse Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. Saul, let's look really quick. Saul, it says he had a son named Sha Shaul or Saul who was young, <clears throat> good looking, right? 
Oh, you old people, you've been there before, right? You were young, good looking. Among the people of Israel, there was no one better looking than he. Let me tell you, if you're going to have put something in the Bible about you, that's a nice thing to say. Of all the things, what, was, what, what do we understand about Saul? He was good looking. And he stood what? <clears throat> Head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel, just like Antonio back there. Strong, good looking, and tall. Right? Lean. He was the image of a king. If anyone was going to say, what, what do we need for a king? It's this guy, right? <clears throat> but morally, temperamentally, he was not a leader at all. He was actually a follower. So his visual misleads people. Then we see David, right? <clears throat> and David's just a little guy out in the field playing with sheep. Jumping over there, I'm counting them. One, two, three. He got to ten. He falls asleep. <laughs> Have to wake back up. That's where we get counting the sheep. Ruddy, redhead, blue-eyed, not necessarily tall, right? Average guy. <laughs> Correct? <coughs> Call an uh, uh, EMT. You having, are you okay? You having a little moment? And we know that when uh, Samuel comes and he says, I'm here to anoint a king, a new king, <clears throat> they bring the firstborn of Jesse, and it's like, that's the guy. And what does God say? They go on down the line, on down the line, until he says, what, you, yeah, you have any more? <clears throat> and when they had come to the firstborn, Elavav, and said, this has to be Jehovah's anointed one, here before him, but Jehovah said to Samuel, what does he say? Well, come on, read it for me now. We are, we are communicating. We are engaging. What does he say? Don't pay attention <clears throat> to how he looks or how tall he is because I have rejected him. And then he gives us an explanation. Jehovah doesn't see the way humans see Humans look at the outward appearance, but Jehovah looks at the heart. You know what it means to look at the heart? He has to listen to what you are saying, to what you're believing, to who you truly are, <clears throat> because the outside can be quite deceiving. Correct? And Jehovah wants you to know <clears throat> he doesn't want you to be a spectator. But a, particip a participant, and in order to do that, you have to do away with your Greek understanding and then adopt this <clears throat> ancient Israeli biblical Judaism kind of thinking that says, I am not moved by what I see. We have a long way because we are very moved by what we see. We even look in the mirror to ourselves and say, you're nothing, you're worth nothing, look at this. And because we're moved by what we see, <clears throat> and he's not moved by what we see. When Moses is telling us <clears throat> throughout Devarim, Deuteronomy, he is telling us that Jehovah does not seek blind obedience. I know that sounds strange, but he does not seek blind obedience. <clears throat> the fact, listen, the fact that there are no Hebrew word for obedience in biblical, in, in biblical understanding and biblical Hebrew, did you all know that? There is no word for obedience in biblical Hebrew. <clears throat> that actually, here is, a, here is a, uh, a religion that has 613 commandments, but no word for obedience. And what they had to do was modern Hebrew had to borrow a verb from Aramaic in order to have an understanding of obedience. Lazayet. <clears throat> and they had to borrow it because there is no word for obedience. He doesn't want blind obedience. If he wanted blind obedience, he would never would have created you because he has angels. Who are what? Blindly obedient. He would also would have created you as a robot if he just wants blind obedience. Correct? 
But what's he want from us? Us to listen. Not just with our ears, but with the very deepest resources of our minds. He simply <clears throat> doesn't seek obedience. He wants people, like Sister Gail said, with a will of their own that will choose to love them. Which is why he places before you blessing and cursing. <clears throat> and the difference will be how you what? Hear. How you hear. And if you hear him <clears throat> and choose life, Torah, you will have blessings. And if you choose not to hear him, you will choose cursing and death. Yehoah, <clears throat> in making us in his image, right, was creating something that we would call otherness. And <clears throat> the bridge between self and other is conversation. Speaking, listening. Speaking, listening. You know, when we speak, we tell others who and what we are. Which is sometimes you've got to be careful what you say. <clears throat> but nonetheless, I don't know who you are by the way you walk. All I know is how you walk. I don't know who you are by what I see and how you dress. All I know is how you dress. You know I'm more than this outfit. As cute as this outfit is, I am more than this outfit. <clears throat> right? And the only way you'll know who I am and what I'm made of is to be able to what? To listen. To speak back and forth. When we listen, <clears throat> we allow others to tell us who they are. One of our biggest problems <clears throat> in the world today and in the house and the kahila and in our own lives is that a lot of times we speak and we fail to listen. And what we have to understand in biblical Judaism, it's about hearing and doing and listening and speaking and listening and speaking and listening. And how many's ever had a conversation with someone who will not listen to what you're saying and will only speak over you trying to get you to understand what they're saying? And if we could just settle down and be quiet and take a turn, <clears throat> you might be surprised what each other is saying because you both might just agree. More than disagree. But I'm not interested in hearing what you got to say. Just let me tell you what I need to tell you. I ain't got time for what you got, all your mess. Just listen to what I got to tell you and move right along. I am the head of this, of this, uh, <clears throat> this relationship. You just do what I tell you to do. And everything will be all right. Really? If we can't listen to other people, and I'm going to say this, and you need to get this. If we can't listen to other people, then we certainly can't listen to Jehovah. I said this way. He said this way. <clears throat> you can't love me and not love people. Right? So that means the speaking and listening is not you alone in your little cave while he's speaking and you're listening. It has to do with being here in a community again. Right? Engage in a community where you are hearing and listening and hearing and listening and speaking and listening, <clears throat> not only to him, but to each other. You know, you'll learn a lot by listening to people. You might learn some of their failures. You might learn why they are the way they are. You might learn a hurt that they're going through, what, what they're feeling, and it might bring empathy or sympathy <clears throat> coming out of you. But if you never listen, if you never speak, you never listen, then you only have that image. Wow, that... That sister or brother, they're rough. Because you haven't taken the time to listen to see maybe why that is. Maybe why it is. So if we can't listen to other people, then we certainly can't listen to Yehovah, whose otherness is not relative but absolute. Which is why the urgency. Moses said it in Deuteronomy 6. He says it again in Deuteronomy 11. It's all, <clears throat> what I say, 92 times in the book of De Deuteronomy. Shema, 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 which means what? Listen. <clears throat> I mean, really, listen. Has anyone ever said, I want to talk to you? 
And what you really need to do is have some Gorilla Tape or some duct tape in your pocket. And when they say that, you just say, sure, hold on a minute, and take it out and tear a little piece and put it on your mouth. Say, now go for it. Because did you ever not be able to complete a thought? Because we like to interrupt each other. Because we're not used to what? Listening. I saw how you came to me. I see what you're going through. I see it in your eyes. I see your attitude. I see how you approached me. And what would you do? Because of seeing you did what? <laughs> right? <laughs> Men, let's face it. What is the one thing we hate to hear from our wives? Oh, we need to talk. <laughs> Oh, can you write it down? Can you send it to the post? You got my email? Come on, man, right? Women are now shocked. What? You don't like to hear my voice? No, not really, sometimes. <laughs> Especially put in that content. I, I need to talk. I need to pray. <laughs> I hear the Lord's calling. <laughs> <laughs> because what's the one thing hard for us to do? Listen. Come on, man. Ladies, I don't know why you're shocked, because that's just the way it is. When you, have, you, know, when you come together as women, that's the way. My husband won't listen to me. Or my husband keeps on. Because you don't get it, right? <clears throat> this is something we both have to work on. It's not something you just throw. Listen, you don't say, uh, we're not doing it good in Kahila, so we've got to get rid of the Kahila. You work on it. That doesn't mean you lock the door and say, you will, pastor has spoken about listening, you will listen. Because you're going to be in serious trouble. <clears throat> have to work on slowly. Do you know what I'm saying? Even if it's small things. Uh, instead of saying, I need to talk to you, 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 you say, I need to talk to you about the dog. Oh, what about the dog? Anyway, the way you treat the dog is the way you treat me. No, see, that's the back door. You can't do that. Shema, 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 really listen. We're not good at it. We're not good at it. <clears throat> Which is why we pack our bags and leave, because we don't want to listen. No one's listening to us, and we think we're uh, not validated because you're not listening to us. And it's a work in progress. We just have to work on it. It's not an <clears throat> I'm out of here situation. A long, long, long time ago, we had someone that said, oh, I want to join when we had a little, con little tiny choir or worship team. I want to join it. Pastor Kenny said, oh, okay, I'll get with you. And because he didn't get with them right away, he packed his bag and his family and left. Well, I didn't know I was supposed to drop everything. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> because, oh, I want to be here. When I speak, I want everyone here. It's conversation, and you have to learn to listen and speak and relax. For us, it's like going off a cliff all the time. We have to hurry up and get it done, be through with it. Listening lies at the very heart of relationship. Now, this is not to make you upset. You go home and you say, I know he's speaking to you. You never talk to me. <clears throat> well, no, if you say something worth listening to, I would hear you. It's not that. Don't do that. I know church people. Come on. You'll be looking at lunch, waiting to say something. Knowing you have to wait till you get home. You'll wait a little while. Drop it in a little bucket. If you don't get the right response, while you weren't listening. Listen to what? You know what I'm talking about. It's the very heart of relationship. We got to work on it. That's all. Right? We're not a perfect church. Come on. Someone says, I'm leaving church because of a way that <coughs> some people, well, you'll be leaving churches all your life. Because I haven't met a perfect person to be in a perfect house at all. You might as well keep your bags packed, never, never, never sit down, never do nothing. Just go in and pass them through. Here I am. Someone will offend me, I know. <coughs> Listening 
is an act of opening yourself up to a mind that is radically other than your own. Because you think differently than I think. <clears throat> and in a marriage, there's some radically different thought going on. Sit down with your children, you're like, well, that's from your Aunt Susie, isn't it? That's a gene pool right there if I've seen one. That's not your mother, that's not me. Where is that coming from? Because we have radically different thinking processes, correct? Am I speaking to the choir? Or is there someone here? To but when we are able to open ourselves up to <coughs> someone else's radically um, uh, radical mind, <coughs> we respect them. We respect their uh, perceptions and their feelings actually matter to us. Some of you have just turned off your ear. You need to turn it on. When we have this listening, we are actually giving them permission to be honest, even if it makes ourselves vulnerable. And none of us like to be vulnerable. Don't make me uncomfortable. Because I will put a wall up when you make me uncomfortable. <coughs> Don't make me uncomfortable. I will shut it down instantly. done and you all been there you know when it's done right <clears throat> as soon as you start feeling uncomfortable it can be male or female as soon as you start feeling uncomfortable what do you do i'm done we'll have to talk about it later or you shut down or you move to the other side we don't like to feel uncomfortable we don't like to be in a church that makes us feel uncomfortable but if you hear the word of god and we are where you are you, we are uncomfortable from time to time you can't be patted on the back all the time That's communication, as he just woke up. <laughs> because it takes courage. It takes courage. It takes courage. <clears throat> I want to share with you what I feel. Well, you're hurting me. I am sorry that it's hurting you. And the reason why it's hurting you is because you're uncomfortable. And the reason why you're uncomfortable is you don't want to listen. Listening, I'll have it up here now, is the antidote to narcissism. And narcissism is the belief that we are the center of the universe. And I know we don't ever think that we are, but so many times we think we are. Right? <coughs> Again, I want to be on a worship team. Uh, can you speak to me? Yeah, I'll get with you. You should have ran. should have ran and talked to me right away. I am the center of the universe. And since you did not run and talk to me right away, I'm out of here. Pastor, I need to talk to you. Okay. I didn't get back to you right away. That's it. That's narcissism. You're not the center of the world. Right? People got things to do. I got things to do. I got to be someplace. I got to do some stuff. I have to study. I have to do some different things. <clears throat> Took the family on vacation to uh, Pennsylvania. That means I had, uh, and because line of Judah 1 is different than line of Judah 2, and now they're behind, I had to get three sermons and portions and Bible studies ready by Wednesday, which actually means by Tuesday, because Wednesday is church, coming back from Harrisonburg, then having church, and Thursday we're out at 6 o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> so I had to make sure. I'm sorry if I didn't answer your text. You're not the center. No, no one sent me a text. I'm using it as an illustration <laughs> that I know of. I'm just telling you, that's narcissism. <clears throat> I asked you to speak to me, and you didn't speak to me. I'm out of here. I'm done. I'm finished. I'm hurt. Why? Because you're narcissistic. You think everything centers around you. You need to learn to listen, and you need to learn to what? Speak and hear and have communication, have relationship. Listening does not mean agreeing, but it does mean caring. I don't have to agree with you, but I do care. Sometimes disagreement thinks we don't care. I can disagree with you and still care about you. I cannot agree with your lifestyle and still love you. Listening is the climate in which love and respect grow. Listening 
Maybe it's my fasting, but I can sense it's <laughs> a real struggle here. Listening is a profoundly spiritual act that can be painful. It is comfortable not to have to listen, not to be challenged, not to be moved out of our comfort zone. Leave me alone. I just want to see you. I just want to love you. I just want to wave at you. But that's not relationship. That's a culture of seeing. That's a spectator. That's a detachment. Not an engagement. Not a relationship. Not a community. Not a family. Listening. I'm wrapping it up for you people. Listening is the greatest gift we can give to another human being. To be listened to, to be heard, is in a redemptive act. What did Yeshua do for you? He heard you, and he answered your call. It's a redemptive act. He heard you, and he came, and he raised you from the dead. He heard you, and he came, and brought you out of a miry clay. He heard you in your distress <coughs> and come to comfort you. It's a redemptive act. <coughs> in biblical Judaism, our relationship with Yehovah is an ongoing tutorial in our relationships with other people. How we relate to him is how we relate to each other. <clears throat> you shut each other down, you shut him down. He'll never be able to talk to you the way that <clears throat> he wants to talk to you. You'll not listen to him if you can't listen to people. We think we can. We think that we're you know, an anomaly, that uh, we, we can do this differently than this, but you can't do this differently than this because this is his body. So what you do to this, you do to him. <clears throat> you ignore this, you ignore him. You don't listen to this, you don't listen to him. He's the head, but has a body. This is the body. <clears throat> That's the important part. If you say, I want to be where he is, then you have to be where the body is. Because the body is where the head is. You want God to hear your prayers <clears throat> while you speak to him? You want him to listen? Then we have to learn to listen to him and listen to one another. But a lot of times it's all about who? Me. Me and my life and what I'm going through and what I'm doing and what I feel and this is what I feel and this is what. And it's called narcissism. I know we don't like to be labeled that, but come on. You know, if you die today, the sun still rises and sets. I know it's going to be a shock to you, but life will continue on. And we will mourn you and you will mourn me but I guarantee you in a year how can we expect Yehovah to listen to us if we fail to listen to our spouse to our children to our brothers and to our sisters to our community it's a rough word it's a rough word for you it's a rough word for me right can we talk? It doesn't have to be a spouse. Anyone. You come to me. Can we talk? What? What? Just give me a hint. What? 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 Give me a hint. Most horrible. I need something to talk to you about. Very important, but I'll get with you later. Really? You're going to get with me later? Oh, joy. I'm excited. I'll be waiting by the phone. So excited. Because we're not used to what? Speaking. Listening. How can we expect to encounter Yehovah if we have not learned to listen? Shema. 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 Listen. Internalize. 
pay attention, <clears throat> be obedient, learn. In 1 Kings 19, you know, we read it. And, uh, do I have it? I, I, I missed something in this over my, you know, I'm uh, going on 58, and this is the first time I saw this. I guess maybe because people preached. He, he was not in the wind. He was not in the fire. <clears throat> he was not in the uh, uh, earthquake. But if you read that verse, uh, even though it says he was not in it, what it means is his, his instruction was not in it. He was in it. It says, <clears throat> he said, go outside and stand on the mountain before Jehovah. So he went outside and he stood. And right then and there, what did Jehovah do? He went past. And any time Jehovah goes past, there's going to be a fuss, correct? And when he went past, what happened? A mighty wind, blast of wind, tore the mountain apart. Well, that's evidence, right? And then what happens? Broke the rocks in pieces before Yehoah, but Yehoah was not in the wind. What do you mean it wasn't he's not in the wind? When he came, he calls the wind. So is he not in the wind or is he in the wind? And the answer is yes. But what was not in the wind? Instruction. Because what's he teaching Elijah? Because what did Elijah have a problem with? Visual. Am I the only prophet left? Is she the only, am I the only one she's ever after? Because he's seeing, right? <clears throat> so what does God do? Go to the ends of the mountain, stand out there, and Jehovah goes by. But he doesn't speak in the wind. He just <clears throat> goes by and creates a wind. But he's not in the wind. Your answer is not in the wind. Oh, man, I came here, and the Holy Ghost fell, and I shouted, and I praised, and glory to God. But that's not where your answer is. Your answer is in this ear, listening to what he's saying to you. He then says, <clears throat> then after the wind came an earthquake, but Jehovah was what? Not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire broke out, but Jehovah was what? Not in the fire. Well, don't invite him for dinner. It's going to really mess up your house. <laughs> and after the fire came, <clears throat> then what came? Quiet, subdued voice. Well, that tells us how to really interact with one another. We know it as a still, small voice. And what does it say? When Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his cloak, stepped out and stood at the entrance to the cave. And then a voice came to him and said, what came to him? Do you understand <clears throat> that there's a purpose of saying, then a voice came? It doesn't say, and Jehovah said, or Jehovah came. It says, the voice came. And the voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? It is the voice that you can only hear if you are listening. Oh, you can see the wind, and you can see the fire, and you can feel the earthquake, but he's not in the seeing. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. <clears throat> How many people did he heal? How many blind eyes saw? How many lame people walked? And yet, when they saw it, they saw what God could do. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean and guarantees them a relationship because they had to hear him to follow him, not see what he did to follow him. And those who saw what he did and followed him, like <clears throat> Pastor Kenny said in John 6, 66, when it got too rough, left him <clears throat> because the seeing can only get you so far. I heard his voice. Is the power of Yeshua's baptism in the dove or the voice? It's the voice. Is the power of the Torah and <clears throat> the ketubah given to them in the lightning and the thunder and the cloud and Shekinah, or is it in the voice, the words? What were they taking into <clears throat> the promised land? Not just the visual, but the words. Let me say this closing, just a couple more. Crowds are moved by great speakers, but lives are changed by great listeners. You can move great crowds by being a great speaker, but a great listener will change lives. 
whether between us or Yehovah or us and other people, listening is the prelude to love. It's the prelude to love. So we need to understand <clears throat> this very, you need it back? We need to understand this very deep spiritual truth in Moses' challenge. What does Moses say? If you listen, Shema. Or what he's really saying is, really, really listening. And if you really listen, life, harvest, blessings, power, glory will be yours. In Deuteronomy, chapter 11, 13 through 15. So if you listen carefully to my mitzvot, which I am giving you today, and that mitzvot is to love Jehovah your God and serve him with all your heart and all your being, then, says Jehovah, I will give your land its rain at the right seasons, including the early fall rains and the late spring rains, so that you can gather in your wheat, your new wine, and your olive oil. And I will give your fields grass for your livestock with the result that you will eat and be satisfied. What does that mean? It means that you won't struggle to hold on. It means that you won't have to fight to maintain. It means he knows what you need when you need it and will give it to you when you need it. And your life will be a great blessing, be very powerful. I don't know why we like to struggle. We struggle because we don't listen. Right? What do we say to our children? The same thing that our parents said. I guess you'll have to learn the hard way because you're not listening to me. And when we were young, <coughs> we didn't think we had to listen. Because what do we say? We saw things. I know. You're not listening. And listening, there's great wisdom. Who, you have glasses? Who has glasses? I was going to read this. I just need them really quick. I'm going to do something out of the ordinary. I'm going to read from the Bible. Oh, you just wanted everyone? Oh, these glasses. Okay. That goes with my outfit. Diamonds. Nice. Great. Let's see what that does. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, <coughs> let me read it again, but I'm going to read more. It says, so if you listen carefully to my mitzvah, which I'm giving you today, to love Adonai, your God, and serving with all your heart and all your being, then, says Adonai, I will give your land and its right <coughs> land its rain at the right seasons, including the early fall rains and the late spring rains, so that you gather in your wheat new wine and olive oil. And I will give your field grass for your livestock with the result that you will eat and be satisfied. But be careful not to let yourselves be seduced so that you turn aside, serving other gods and worshiping them. If you do, <coughs> the anger of Adonai will blaze up against you. He will shut up the sky so that there will be no rain. The ground will not yield its produce, and you will quickly pass away from the good land Adonai has given you. Therefore, you are to store up what? These words of mine in your heart and all your being tie them on your hand as a sign put them at the front of a headband around your forehead teach them carefully to your children talking about them when you sit at home what is talking to them when you sit at home speaking and listening listening and speaking <clears throat> when you're traveling on the road, when you lie down and when you get up, write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates so that you and your children will live long on the land. Adam and I swore to your ancestors that he would give them for as long as there is sky above the earth. For if you will take care to obey all these mitzvah I am giving you to do them, to love Adam and I, your God, to follow all his ways and to cling to him, then Adam and I will expel all these nations ahead of you and will dispose dis possess nations bigger and stronger than you are 
and wherever the sole of your footsteps will be yours. Your territory will extend from the desert to the Lebanon and to the river, the Euphrates River, to the Western Sea, and no one will be able to withstand you. Adonai, your God, will place the fear and dread of you on all the land you step on as he told you. There's power in hearing. There's power in hearing. There's power in relationship, which has to do with hearing. There's power in relationship, which has to do with speaking and hearing. <clears throat> they saw God in the mountain, and they saw God in the glory, and they saw God in the cloud, and they saw God as the earth opened up, and they saw God in the plagues, and they saw God, and they saw God, and they saw God. But seeing God was not going to maintain obedience. They had to hear him. Shema. And in hearing, they had to pay attention, which brought them to obedience. Because what does God not want? Robots. Blind obedience. He wants you to hear him. Then be obedient to him. Yeshua said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. May the Lord open up your deaf ears. May the Lord unstop the ears that refuse to hear. And may the Lord release the tongue that you might be able to speak and hear. Not only to him, but to each other. In our relationships as husbands and wives as our relationships with our children and ourselves, and in this relationship that we have with one another. It's the power of an egg. The power of the fellowship is not that we eat. In case you missed it, the power of the fellowship is that you converse, speak, and be spoken to. Speak and hear so that you might know who each other are. And when you know it, then sometimes we're more tolerable, more loving, more kind, if we truly hear, if we truly open our ears. Amen? Let's stand before him. Before we call the children, I just, I just want you to close your eyes for one second. And I want you to shut out everything else that's around you, and I want you <clears throat> very simply to say to the Lord, Lord, I want to hear you. And I want you to open up your ears. You know, when we come and we praise him, and we come and we worship him, and we sing, <clears throat> it really is singing to him, and then he speaks to us. <clears throat> if in our praise and worship you've only come to engage in the praise and worship, you're missing the point of the praise and worship. It's to foster relationship. <clears throat> if you sit there, don't praise and worship, don't sing, don't interact, it's because you still have Greek thought. You're detached instead of being engaged. <clears throat> ask him to take away that spirit of detachment and give you a spirit of engagement, a spirit of relationship. <clears throat> and even when it's hard and he speaks to us because he doesn't withhold his rod from us and he doesn't withhold his discipline from us, which means sometimes he's loving and kind in his words and sometimes he's harsh but still loving and kind because he doesn't let us get away with things. We have to learn <clears throat> to move away from our comfort zone. Pastor Kenny, away, away from the noise. I don't know all that song, but that's a beautiful song. As we sing it, I want to invite you to take a step of faith and say, Lord, 
I'm getting out of my seat. <clears throat> I'm coming to the altar. And what I'm asking you to do, you and only you, anoint my ears. Anoint my ears that I can truly start hearing you. Anoint my ears that I might hear the people in my community. Open up my mouth that I might speak truth. And that I might speak to you and speak to each other. Change us. Shift us. Let us be a people of engagement, not a people of detachment. And for your pleasure I exist. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. See, you're just singing to him. You're speaking to him. He'll respond. He'll respond to you as you say to him, it's by your will. I just want to bless your name. <clears throat> this is speaking and hearing. I just want to make you glad. I just want to move your heart, yeah. To give you all I am. Come on, engage. It's by your will. And for your pleasure I exist. You are worthy. So powerful. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. No one desires. My one desire is. Come on, engage. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I just want to make you glad. I just want to move your heart to give you all I am. Father, forgive us. We haven't heard you. It's by your will. And for your pleasure I exist. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. Away. Away. 
my one desire is Come on. engage to worship you I live to worship you I live It's by your will and for your pleasure I exist and you are worthy Lord you are worthy Forgive us, forgive me for not hearing you in the way that you want me to hear you. Father, forgive me of my lack of hearing. Lack of hearing, Father, as you speak to me, I repent. I repent. Teshuvah, ask you to forgive me, Father. <clears throat> to my wife, 
Gail, forgive me for not hearing. Times that you've spoken, I have not heard. I repent to my children. Forgive me. To the grandchildren, forgive me. To the body, to the brothers, to the sisters, to the community, forgive me. Father, let us move. Be greater. Be better. To speak, to hear, to listen, to pay attention, to eternalize. Bring us to a greater level, higher place in you. And for that, we'll give you praise. In Yeshua's name. Before the children come, just go around each other and ask them, forgive me for not hearing. Forgive me for not hearing you. Whether it's a spouse, whether it's a child, whether it's a brother or sister, <clears throat> you're not admitting to anything. You're just telling them. You know, you haven't heard. You haven't listened. You haven't engaged. <clears throat> oh, oh. Every Sabbath, exactly right. I hear you. <clears throat> Father, in the name of Yeshua, I thank you for their lives. I thank you, Lord, whether they are Rebecca or Rachel or Leah, Sarah. Father, whether they are uh, Manasseh or Joseph and Ephraim, Peter or Paul, John or Esther. Father, make them who you want them to be. Draw them close to you. Father, let their path be clear. Let them see. Let them, Father, hear you. Let us teach them how to hear you, Father, in our lives. Open their ears that they might hear and that they might walk in your ways always. Even where we fail, Father, cover us that they only see you in our lives. <coughs> Father, we thank you and praise you for what you're going to do in their lives. Father, as you bring them to a place, Father, of ministry, of authority, Father, of changing this generation, and we'll give you praise. Father, as you make them uh, uh, foundations, stones, living stones in this house, Father, we thank you for their lives. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Lift up your hands to receive the priestly blessing. <coughs> Sorry, y'all, I just saw the time. It's a little lengthy. I don't know who that preacher is. Yevarechecha yeah, 
Yehovah, he who exists, kneel before you, presenting gifts, and will guard you with a hedge of protection. Yehovah, he who exists, will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bringing order, and he will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being and look upon you. He will set in place all you need to be whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. May Yehovah hear from heaven, quickly answer all our requests. Save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. See you in the Oneg.